Nature is never too far from one's reach in Australia. Even Sydney siders can access natural bushland not far from their homes. But these refuges for native animals and plants are constantly threatened by the ever-growing suburbs and human activities. Their future is in the hands of nature-loving individuals who devote countless hours researching, observing and protecting the environment. One such individual is Dr George Hongai, a retired museum professional, a somewhat old-fashioned, or shall we say, rather classical naturalist. George was born in Budapest and migrated to Australia almost 35 years ago. He is many things, sculptor, writer, taxidermist, entomologist, but above all he is a naturalist. How does one become a naturalist? As a child I was already interested in exotic foreign places and uh, I was always dreaming about going away from Europe as further away as possible. And I think I could say that I found all those wonderful things, all those exotic plants and animals, insects. Ever since I was eight years old, I started to collect beetles, I started to observe birds and hang around museums when I was about that age. And uh, I started to pick up the technical bits and pieces of information about taxidermy and uh, entomology, you know, the science of insects. The story of my life is that ever since I'm doing the same thing, probably on different levels, but uh, I still consider myself as an amateur and uh, a very keen one on top of that and my interest uh, always remained the same and the insects remained a very strong and a very private interest of mine uh, and I still, still keep doing the same thing. A lot of animals get killed on the roads, uh, more than most people would think. If you go along anywhere, even just in the suburbs of Sydney where there is a bit of bush left, uh, rest assured there will be a dead animal somewhere and that's just the proof of it how many animals get killed. Um, electrical wires kill them as well and dogs kill them, cats kill them. Unfortunately we never run out of specimens. There is a legal aspect to all this. To hold protected fauna, even if they are roadkills, you need a license from the wildlife protection authorities. Taxidermy is a bit like magic. In a taxidermist's house, you can never tell what is alive Hello. and what is not. We taxidermists are always the butt of jokes. Um, I can see the funny side of it myself, of course, but uh, before you, you, you get to the funny bits, you have to learn a fair bit about it, and uh, it's really not that easy to, um, to do it well and do it... Uh, um, efficiently enough to, to make a living out of it. You can't do taxidermy without loving what you're doing. It's a, it's a rather horrible job for someone who, who really doesn't want to do it and just have to do it for a living. So um, uh, I think I'm, I'm a lucky one. I always enjoyed it. First, the specimen is skin. The skin is preserved with chemicals. An artificial body made from wood, wool and wire structure is replacing the natural body. So the taxidermist is always um, regarded a little bit like a, a bit of a magician because for most people it's very difficult to, to, to comprehend how a, a dead animal uh, suddenly just looks like it would be alive. The application of taxidermy has been changed a lot in the last few years too. Um, like many years ago, the, the main purpose really of the taxidermist, a part of a, a proper museum taxidermist, the taxidermist used to cater for hunters. They used to do all the trophy heads and uh, trophy animals and so on. Uh, now people have a different idea about the whole thing. Hunting is not as popular as it used to be. Uh, the idea of killing an animal and take its skin off and have it mounted or stuffed and put it on the wall, it just doesn't appeal to a lot of people. Taxidermists nowadays work usually for um, 
public education or, or public interpretation services and so on. So the animals which we do are usually not purposefully killed for that, that particular reason that they are stuffed and put on display. So this is uh, where this bird is going to stay for many more years to come, hopefully. And uh, let's hope that it's going to do a good purpose. Uh, together with the other specimens and the insect collection and all the text and the panels, um, will demonstrate the diversity of, of the wildlife of this area. But taxidermy is only one aspect of being a naturalist. Studying animals is another. In our environment, there are many more invertebrate animals, such as insects, than vertebrate, such as birds. Their study is equally, if not more, important. George spends a lot of time searching and studying insects, for George is also an entomologist. These bills are quite peculiar. They, they look after their, their eggs and then they look after the actual larvae by uh, providing food for them. They process the food and then they, they literally they fed it to, to their offsprings. And then they release them because it's, it's a very small area and you have to be careful not to deplete the fauna too much. In order to identify the insects, one must have a reference collection. George's collection holds almost 100,000 beetles from all over the world. A collection like this is more or less like a library, as each identified specimen possesses a wealth of information. In my entomological activities, I'd rather focus on one smaller group than, than do everything. And uh, my favorite group is the scallops. I can say without being too immodest that I'm a bit of an expert in the scallops. And uh, uh, I do some work for uh, colleagues and, and other collectors who uh, probably know a bit less about it. I get this material sometimes even from overseas, like this lot comes from Germany. And um, they wanted me to find out the names of, of these uh, particular beetles. For shipments like this, you need clearance from the Australian Customs and Quarantine Authority. They could be quite uh, different, although they, at the first glance they look the same, because that group, it's an elephant beetle, that group has many, many uh, subspecies within their own kind. So what I do in order to examine them, I soak these dry specimens in a bit of um, lukewarm water and detergent, and once they softened up, um, like that, you see, once the, the, the legs are flexible, I use a special insect pin which is a, a stainless steel pin and uh, I put the pin through the right wing covers left upper corner like that and then uh, I just simply pin it out on a block of foam uh, the legs should uh, should be nice and uh, symmetric this way and because uh, it's going to take a few days to dry and in the drying process it might sort of moves a bit here and there I fix the position of the legs with pins and once the beetle dries then of course the legs won't change their positions anymore so um, they can be placed in a collection. The computer and the internet helps me a great deal to keep in touch with colleagues all around the world and also um, helps me to uh, write my articles for professional journals and, and uh, magazines for overseas. It also helps me to, to write my books. Articles, George has published eight yeah, books so far, Spanish. four in English, four in Hungarian. They cover a wide range of subjects. Some of these books made him well known among the younger generation of naturalists and adventurers. George and his wife Kathy share this interest in natural history. Kathy's language skills can help when studying foreign references. 
In my books, I sometimes deal with uh, more serious and sometimes more light-hearted matters, but no matter what it is, I like to lighten it up a little bit with, uh, with my own illustrations, which are more or less like cartoons, just to make it a bit more interesting for younger readers. To top it all, George is also a very good cartoonist. I do a self-portrait for you, huh? So um, that's all the, the sketching what I do, that, that goes very quick, and then uh, I just detail it out with an <laughs> with ordinary black felt pen. Lucky my features are ugly enough, so it's easy to draw a caricature of it, you know. Age and a uh, bit of a brutish face has an advantage when it comes to drawing. As a taxidermist, George not only makes dead animals look alive, but he restores inanimate objects as well. This artifact from Papua New Guinea has been sent to George by a client who wants to have it restored. Cleaning of a, a sculpture like that is always rather tricky because the pigment, the, the paint on these um, uh, tribal carvings, are usually not uh, consolidated. That means that if you rub it with a wet sponge or with a towel, uh, the, the colors will wipe off and um, obviously then you just lost uh, most of the, of, the, of, the, of the beautiful detail of it. George uses a soft brush to gently dry the artifact. He then removes as much dust as possible without harming it. A properly restored object does not necessarily mean it will look brand new. Uh, a good restoration on an artifact like that is when you can't see any sign of it at all. So if, if I would turn this into a beautiful, gleaming and shiny, new-looking thing, it would mean that, that I ruined it. To fix up the damage on these pig's tusks, George must establish which type of glue was originally used. It was most probably a tree resin that George tries to match. He notes the whole procedure for each restoration work and then attaches it to the object for future reference. It's important that it's always uh, pretty clear, you know, if what was done by the original artist, uh, the original creator of this, 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 this artifact, and what was done by a later uh, um, laboratory technician or a restorer like myself. Uh, when it's finished, it shouldn't look like it was never touched by me. And that is the sign of a master restorer or taxidermist which is what George Hongai is.